I'm uh, going to do very quickly about polyphotonics. I'm not going to talk, talk too much about us. And then I'm going to tell you very, very quickly about this and how it works. And again, I think a few people have already seen this, so I won't focus on that. And, and I'll mostly talk about the journey. How did we get from you know, a single person with an idea to all the traction we now have with the NHS? And I think that's the interesting bit. And that's the bit that's becoming a case study. Um, we were talking this morning about the Hauser report. Uh, polyphotonics managed to make it in that about four times, I think. And, and so people are really picking up on, on the, it's not a template because every business is different, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some lessons. And if polyphotonics hadn't had, had it all comes down to individuals. If I hadn't had met a certain person working at CPI, said, come up and have a look. One thing led to another. Soon we had an arrangement. All these things happen, you know, by accident. And here we are, you know, five years later with something very significant that's going to add real value. So, let's see if I can make this work. Joining the dots, that's my subtitle, and that will become uh, apparent in the, in the last slide, I think. So, Polyphotonics. We are two companies, I think. Um, this one gets all the, all the press, everyone talks about this, it's the sexy side. But actually, more people in the company still work in this pit. And this is how we started. We are at heart a company of physicists and chemists, and... Most people are working on OLED process development. And, you know, and that's really what we're doing. And I, I won't tell you too much about how these two things are linked, except for the fact that making OLEDs is really, really bloody difficult. It's, it's astonishing. And my first idea, when we had a very nice technology strategy board grant to do that, was to build a process for manufacturing OLEDs in very high volumes. And as this project developed and... You know, a couple of years into the, into the business, I was thinking, God, this is, this is really hard work. Because my previous business had been all about manufacturing. And so I now find myself at the helm of a business that was all about research, which was fine, exactly what I wanted to do, except I couldn't see an end point. I didn't really know when we are going to go out and make something. So um, and Nigel's smiling wily at me. We had some interesting board meetings about how we're going to achieve that. Um, so... For those who don't know OLEDs, I think most people do, so I won't tell you too much, uh, printed light. And currently we mostly print onto uh, glass substrates, but that's moving to flexible substrates, and it's becoming flexible and conformable and all of those things. Um, I went out purposely looking for an application that could use all my OLEDs that I was struggling to make. But, you know, we're thinking long term, we've got a vision. And... I purposely went out to, well, I realized that I needed an application that had a relatively low performance threshold. So low performance in terms of luminosity, it didn't have to be that bright. Low performance for shelf life, we're talking a year or so. And low performance for active life. And healthcare came up every single time. Now, if you think about it, you know, healthcare, if you're making a smart bandage or something of that ilk, then, you know, something that's going to be on the skin, you're going to use it for a few hours. It doesn't have to be very bright. So everything pointed in that direction. And, and I started to attend a lot of uh, medical conferences, got very, very interested in the area, and eventually came across the idea. And that was the bit, I think, that Polyphotonics did. We linked up the two, and we link, linked up two industries almost. Um, that was all very well and good. But we had to make it credible. And I, I came to the board, and the board said, well, that's, that's a bit of a step, Richard. Um, I went out and found a number of people, very important influencers in the field, and created an advisory board. Now, that was an important bit. That was a huge step for polyphotonics because most small SMEs, you know, you're developing this idea, don't app appoint advisory boards. And before I knew it, I had the Dean of Medicine uh, from Durham. I had a uh, very eminent professor from, uh, from Royal College in Liverpool, all on my board advising me. We went to the NHS, well, we went to the SBRI initially for a, for, a, for a grant, and this was for one of the very, very early feasibility grants. And, of course, they wanted to double-check it. They thought, is this pseudoscience or is it real science? Um, and they put an independent health economist onto the project, and this was the extract from the report. Now, when this happened, and I, I saw that extract, that gave everybody, you know, the confidence to know that we were doing something meaningful. If this is half as good as we expected it to be, back in, only back in 2012, seems like a, a long time ago, actually. It was only a couple of years ago. 
Uh, they wanted to get this into the NHS as fast as possible, so we all thought, right, we'll do this. So what did we do? We recognised a disease, a terrible disease, called diabetic retinopathy. Uh, it's one of the most common causes of blindness in the Western world. Uh, it's caused by diabetes per se. There are two types of diabetes, type 1, which is fairly constant as a portion of the population, but type 2, and type 2 is epidemic. It's out of control, and this is the tsunami of cost that is coming towards the NHS. I mean, there's, there isn't a Today programme on Radio 4 that doesn't mention in some form the cost faced by the NHS because of diabetes. It's just there. Um, there are about... 280,000 people diagnosed with diabetes every year. That's the population of Newcastle coming into the NHS every single year. Now, the really scary bit is 67% of people with type 2 will develop some form of retinopathy within 10 years. That's terrible. The, that, that means you're going blind. And 90% of type 1. Now, as I've begun to... I've become quite an expert in this... Type 1, it eventually catches up on you. You can manage your uh, sugar levels, you can be the best behaved patient, but eventually it will catch up with you. Type 2, by definition, is almost a self-selective disease. Type 2 people don't manage particularly well and they are heading into, you know, cost. The cost to the NHS, the additional cost of somebody who goes blind in their mid-50s is £280,000 per person. That's on top of all the NHS cost uh, in treating them. So, we got very interested in this. As I said, I'd been talking to some people in the world, uh, in the ophthalmic world, who said they got a, a possible therapy. I apologise for this. I'm, I, I've become quite used to these now, but I remember the first time I, I said, wow, that's a tough one. We developed this, uh, the mask. It's a non-invasive treatment for diabetic retinopathy, and, and it works. And in fact, it works so well, it's almost twice as effective as this. This is the incumbent treatment. So very quickly, put it in context, the eye is the most oxygen-hungry organ in the body. Um, it's uh, counterintuitively when you go to sleep at night. Your macular area here at the back, these are the photoreceptors that sit behind the macula, uh, uses twice as much oxygen as it does during the daytime. Now, there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, when we're walking around in daytime, we use primarily our cones, when we go to sleep at night, it's our rods that become hypersensitive and so we can see in twilight. And as they become hypersensitive, they start to become more and more active and they demand more energy and they use twice as much oxygen. That was controversial a few years ago. Um, we've, we, we, we hit upon the theory that if you can prevent the eye from hypoxiating at night, you can prevent this neovascular growth. And it's the neovascular growth, compromised neovascular growth, that's a problem. So at the moment, we have this vicious circle. At night, you hypoxiate. You, you, the body reacts by producing a protein called VEGF, which stimulates neovascular growth. We, we demand that neovascular growth to get more oxygen into the eye. Now, the big one at the moment, the big treatment, is interocular injection. This is a $6.5 billion drug. That's the expensive one. It's costing the NHS about £10,000 per eye per patient. The other one is photo co co photocoagulation, laser treatment. Uh, that's not really a treatment. What you do is laser burn the peripheral of the eye and eventually you run out of areas to, to continue to laser and eventually you, use your, you lose your peripheral vision and then you lose your driving licence. So it's, you know, it's, it's a treatment of sorts, it's a bit of an heroic treatment. So what we realized is if we could cut out the hypoxiation from happening in the very first place, we break this vicious circle and the, bot and the eye doesn't stress. Um, great idea, but how do you prove that? So we embarked upon a series of clinical trials and this was the difficult bit. You know, it's uninvestable. An SME trying to do, prove some theories, albeit on some very important papers, uh, with clinical trials that are going to last three, four, five years, isn't investable. You can't do it. Um, this is how it works in the NHS. So we have cost here, and this is the UK population with a disease, and this is the population moving towards blindness, and this is the increased cost. And you can see a smaller and smaller amount of people moving towards blindness are costing the NHS more and more money. 
and they're costing more, the NHS more and more money because the NHS is not in the business of prevention, only in treatment. And the NHS basically has to wait until the very last po point of intervention, and at that point, they choose either Lucentis or laser. It's the injection or this. So when we put it to the health economists that we have something different, the interesting point was at what point does our treatment become valid? Do we intervene here at the current point of intervention, or can we intervene further up here to early onset and prevent this line from even happening? And that's what we're trying to do. It's in, and hopefully in the next few years, as the uh, treatment becomes more accepted, this line will eventually disappear. And we'll have a higher portion of people using it earlier on, so they're saving even more of their eyesight. And it works. It works spectacularly well, actually. What I didn't say is the, the mask is full of electronics. Uh, we developed this almost... Well, it was a very good thing to develop, but it was almost by accident because as we were looking at the clinical trials, we realized that we had to control the patients. And at the moment, the, you know, the, the best system is sleep diaries. Now, a sleep diary, you just tell your physician what he wants to hear. Did you have a nice night's sleep? Yes, I did. Did you wear the mask? Yes, I did. There's no way of knowing. So we built capacitive sensors inside the mask that actually record the amount of time you wear the, wear the treatment. So it ensures full compliance. Uh, I won't go into this, but we've been running a lot of trials in the Czech Republic. These are patients of Czech Republic. The interesting bit is, the bit you need to know is that is a cyst in the macula. And you can see there, after six months of treatment, wearing the mask, wearing this simple thing at night, we've got the fovea returning. And interestingly, the thickness of the ma mask has gone down from, uh, from the, or the macula has gone down from 500 microns to 363. That's the important bit. Now, I think for today, the important bit is, is how do we do that? Um, we've done that very cleverly through joining the dots. We, I think we're a small SME that operates and behaves like a much, much larger company. We basically behave like, uh, or to an extent, like CPI. We're probably the most audited SME in the UK. And that's because we've raised £14 million worth of government funding. And all of that money comes with conditions. And part of the condition is continuous auditing. And I think it just, just goes on and on and on. But what we've managed to do is from initial, you know, grants, feasibility grants here, proof of purpose grants there, we've joined the dots and we've gone to different bits of government continuously and said, we've just done this, we've funded this, we've proved this concept through the TSB. Now you as the NHS, could you pick up on that and run with that bit? And then we've gone to another part of government and said, okay, we've done this bit, can we go to that bit? Now, on the panels earlier on, we're talking about the challenges for SMEs and, you know, how do they find out about this information, et cetera, et cetera. I think governments actually do innovate, doing a pretty good job of it, but it is a challenge. And one of the advantages of being with uh, CPI is that they were able, well, they are very capable and able to help me put this structure together. As an SME, you know, imagine my own finance department. You know, we might outsource it to one person, but as an SME with 20-odd employees, my finance department would not be able to manage this. We need help and advice in order to do that. Pushing 14 million through a very small SME is no mean challenge. And then on top of that, we're working with 11, uh, currently seven universities, 11 projects and seven universities. I mean, this is a logistical nightmare, but we do it very efficiently. And we do it all the time, continuously. So what have we done? You know, these are very difficult challenges to get. Lots of the money is, is, is peer-reviewed. You know, we go through uh, continuously in London in front of Dragon Den-type scenarios justifying what we're doing. Um, we've used government funding from a number of places. Clinical trials take the time they take. We can't fudge a clinical trial. And this is one of the other challenges. You know, innovation in med tech in particular is very, very difficult in the UK because there is absolutely zero appetite for investing in med tech. Um, even CE certification demands a proof of efficacy. Well, that's an easy thing to say, but very, very challenging, because proof of efficacy only comes with clinical trials. You have to prove that the thing works. So, so this, was, this is a very interesting slide, really. We've won lots of awards. Uh, this is really quite exciting. Uh, we've won five awards in four weeks. And in fact, one night last week, we won two, two awards in one night which is absolutely fantastic. I've actually had to send people off to different parts of the country to pick up these things.
but really exciting. And some of these awards are very high profile indeed. This is what it's all about. This is the return on the investment. This is where the taxpayer gets something back. And again, a panel member earlier said it's very important that we make things in this country because that anchors everything else in the infrastructure. It anchors the supply chain. Polyphotonics now is in a really fortunate position. We've diluted about 10% over the last few years. We've raised some money, we've diluted about 20%. But that means we have a lot of equity in the company. The founder members, myself, CPI, and some other people, we still have that company. That's giving us options. And one of those options is to take a very long-term view on the future. And part of that view is building a factory. And this is what we're doing with NetPark. Uh, a couple of people from NetPark here, thank you very much. They are uh, put some very generous uh, financial terms in place. That means we can build this. And this, this project's already started, and we're looking at completion in about 18 months. Gratuitous slide. Again, it's, I think, uh, lead entrepreneur was one of Graham's points. That was me 12 years ago with a beard and long hair. And these are my paintings. I used to be a painter, and that was my life. So I've gone in the last 12 years from, from a, a painter to this, in charge of a, uh, you know, a very high-tech business. But that's interesting in of itself. You know, most of my employees have PhDs. I feel like I've got a PhD now in a number of different subjects. But... It's, uh, it takes all these different types. It takes this maverick, if I suppose, to, to, to think slightly differently, drive it relentlessly, and get the best out of people. And, you know, I'm constantly talking with people in the Northeast about how do we replicate this example. But I think the learning from this is that if you want a case study, CPI have managed to create something with a great deal of help, uh, that's going to really add value, both in terms of benefiting people who are suffering from a terrible disease, but also saving the NHS an awful lot of money. Thank you.